Welcome to Focus Washington. I'm Chuck Conconi. My special guest today is a colleague of mine, Wyeth Ruthman, who's a senior director at Corvus. And we're going to talk today about a subject that's complicated to me, Twitter. Thanks for being a oh, guest. Oh, thanks, Chuck. Yeah, it's always, it's always a pleasure. Well, you put out a release, and you're talking about measuring the political candidates. And Kane, who, of course, has been a surprise in this campaign, is leading Romney on the value of Twitter accounts. What does that mean? That's right. Well, what we wanted to do was is we wanted to kind of put a, a, a monetary value on the candidate's use of Twitter. That if you wanted to replicate communicating to an audience of a certain size with a certain frequency, if you wanted to do that through traditional media or through other online media, what the candidates are doing basically for free on Twitter, what would that, what would that cost? And what you find is, is that first of all, Kane has been growing exponentially in terms of the number of followers That's that he's right, had. Yes. His, 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 the number of followers has grown. It grew 29% in September. It grew 68% in October, even before you know, this, this recent news about, about Herman Kane broke. But it's, if I can interrupt you a second, I mean, everybody says he's not really a serious candidate. He is never in the end going to get the nomination. Why is this happening? Well, I think, I think it's a matter of, you know, Twitter doesn't measure votes, but it does measure momentum. And I, think, and I think the kind of rise that you saw that he had in the polls, there's an interest about him, and that interest tr translates online. And really, it's, you're making a much smaller investment in a candidate by following them on Twitter than giving them a donation or giving them your vote. And so I think, I think the, the, this interest around Herman Cain is, is mirrored by, by, the, by the rise in the number of followers he's had on Twitter. Now, this is the first presidential campaign where Twitter has had any That's right. way to play. Now, how does it compare with older political campaigns? Well, you know, one of the things that I've always, I've always told people about the speed at which campaigns adapt to technology is the idea that YouTube didn't exist in the 2004 election. It came along around in 2006, and you had things, you know, the Obama girl parody, you had the Makaka incident, you know, in George Allen's campaign. So YouTube was really came of age politically in 2006. Twitter, while it existed in the, in the 2008 campaign, really didn't come into its own until 2009 when a lot of, and originally it was Republican users, began using it. One of the, one of the first people to early adopters of Twitter was Newt Gingrich. He started, he started tweeting in January of 2009. And the following that he's built, he has about 1.3 million followers. I was going to say that. I noticed on your report that you put out that he's <laughs> way ahead of everyone, only behind Barack Obama. That's true. But I think, I think th there, those numbers are a little bit misleading because I think because he started so early, he's had a head start in building followers. That's number one. Number two is that beginning in like two, when Newt Gingrich first started using Twitter, Twitter actually had a special feature where they would suggest certain users, celebrities, some politicians. They had a suggested users list where people who were new to Twitter, you know, they were given people that, oh, you might like to follow. So I think a lot of people began following Gingrich because Twitter thought it might be a good sure. idea. Uh, you know, so one of the things that we do in our study, and I think that's why looking at rate of growth is so important, um, as opposed to numbers of followers, because while Newt Gingrich has a large number of followers, his growth rate month to month, it's really only about like one half of one percent. Um, and you compare it with President Obama. President Obama was also a sure. I mean, suggested, he has significant numbers, and Twitter suggested that people follow him as well as Gingrich, and so his numbers got got boosted by that. But I think you look month to month with President Obama, he's still, he's still gaining followers at a rate of about 5% a month as compared with Gingrich where his growth has really been flat. Can we extrapolate? I mean, does this in any way, could it be measured in future votes? I think, I think to the extent that people are able to raise money off of this, to where people are able to you know, get their information about the campaigns, I think, I think Twitter has been more effective as a tool for the press shop in a campaign and the fundraising office than, than in get out the vote operations, at least, at least thus far. 
But voters, there are voters out there who are paying attention to it. They're oh, looking absolutely. At, they're looking at the, but they're such short little messages. Well, I mean, yes, we can was a short little message. Oh, you know, I mean, it's the, the, these a things, bumper sticker. They, and, and it comes back to bumper stickers. I mean, you know, when I, when I first, start, first started working on campaigns, you know, someone gave me a bumper sticker and they said, put this in your, on your car. A bumper sticker is the equivalent of $400 in radio or, or television That's advertising in terms of people see it, you get your name recognition out there, you do things like that. So really what we've done in this study is extrapolate that forward where a 140 character message in President Obama's case delivered to 10 million people, you know, those messages go out, you know, 100 times a month. What would that, what, how, what would it cost to replicate that campaign through traditional paid media? And and so you that's, that's, you that's say we, in your report it would be one million four hundred ninety-two thousand thirty-three dollars. Yeah. Now, how do you get that per message? Is there a breakdown? Well, there? well, what we do is we, you know, we have a we looked at you know other whether it's direct mail, whether it's online advocacy. You know, we looked at traditional means of communicating with voters online, um, and you can price that. You can you can determine how much. If you wanted to buy a list of, e of emails of political activists, you can put a price on that. Um, and then if you wanted to get your message out X number of times a month uh -huh. to that list or through a banner ad online or through an ad on Facebook, you can put a price on that. So for Twitter, and like in President Obama's case, if you have 10 million followers and you're tweeting to them 100 times a month, what would a campaign, what would a similar campaign cost if you wanted to do it through through paid online advocacy. Oh, well, we're going to have to, we're running out of time, but are you going to be doing this throughout the campaign year? We've got a year to go. Yeah, we've, we're going to continue to do it. I think we've already learned a lot about, you know, who's up and who's down in a given month. And I think, I think as the campaign goes on, goes forward, you know, you've got, you've got President Obama sitting on a, on a, on a $1.4 million account and the other candidates are, are, Moving to catch up, and they're growing. They're growing by leaps and bounds. So I think I think it'll be an exciting race online. Oh, why we're going to have you come back from All time right. to time? I hope you will. Oh, sure. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks for being a lot. Here. I'm Chuck and Coney, and this has been Focus Washington.